So obviously, this case was completely inexactly, not necessarily, but there were a lot of exaggerated case facts in here because the point was uh, to get you to think through um, the fraud triangle, right? And so remember, the fraud triangle, you have incentives and pressures on one, at one, one end, another point you have opportunities, such as a lack of internal controls, and then on the other point you have um, rationalizations and attitudes. And so all of those factors are so evident in this case. But some of the internal and external performance factors at the company was that you knew, obviously, there were errors in the financial statements, right? You would know that, um, like they just said, there's no internal controls. So if you can rely on internal controls, if internal controls are quite ineffective, and so the, the chances that there's a material misstatement in the financial statements are really, really high because of high inherent risk and high um, control risk. So um, there's obvious areas that you saw that they use a small local accounting firm as an auditor, right? And so what, the, the, what happens in situations like that is you remember, um, for generally accepted auditing standards, auditors have to have the expertise and the knowledge to perform the audit. Right, so an audit firm really shouldn't take on a company that they're incapable of auditing right, because they don't have the manpower, they don't have the resources, they don't have the skill set to audit that company. And also when you're a smaller firm, you might face more pressure right, to, to not lose a client because you don't. It's not like you're the big four or even the you second tier largest firms, right? It's not, you, you have, you don't have that many clients. And so you become more dependent on a client and you're more, um, the chances that you can succumb, succumb to management pressure is even greater. Um, another thing I think someone pointed out that there's no corporate governance because of the audit committee, right? Who's on the audit committee? There's no audit committee that selects the firm. So as a result of that, the, the accounting firm has no cover, right? They, they report, and essentially, they not report to management, but they answer to management, right? So they're more susceptible to management pressure to follow uh, what management wants. Um, there's uh, a lot of changes in the estimates, and there's no apparent reason for any increasing or decreasing reported earnings. So basically, that is a red flag that's telling you that management is managing earnings. With, and they're probably managing earnings to cover up frauds or meet whatever expectations. Um, the, there's been frequent change in the company's ownership, except for Kabev's uh, share, right? That's the only constant, but that's the person behind all the mostly everything. Um, there, if you did, in the planning stage, if you looked at the procurement costs, you would see that those costs are really high. And so one of the things that you in the planning stage, you're going to look at it um, as compared to prior years, but also as compared to the industry standards and, and competitors. And in this case, there's really high, so that is something that you want to uh, look at. And then they have they do small supplies and contractors instead of working with major um, manufacturers and contractors, right? And so again, similar to the small CPA firm or accounting firm, when you're using smaller firms, they're more dependent on your business, right? So they they might be willing to play ball with you, do what you want to do, so that they can retain your business, your business, because they're highly reliant on it. So those are just some factors that if you know an auditor is looking at, they're going to look at. Well, why are you using small suppliers when you have? Because the one thing you you can possibly get with larger suppliers are volume discounts, right? Because larger suppliers, because they have so many customers they're able to charge a lower price, right? To, to, um, they, they're able to give their customers discounts. Um, the culture and the history, uh, the country is one uh, it, that is one that is very uh, loose, right? There's corruption as the law. That's the way they do business. Um, and so it's accepted. So that was one of the, why I posed the question to uh, the last team is, you know, it's, that was a great suggestion to have, and you should, that's just a, a, an important part of the control requirement, is to have an ethics officer, or have someone at the top who is just responsible for dealing with these types of issues. But the culture is one that you have to now change the way people think, 
right? And how, and so this in this company is if you have a lot of um, you know uh, you have a lot of that baked into people. Um, I talked about the fact that there's uh, you know uh, contracts of um, the errors in the financial statements. Uh, again, a red flag. Uh, the transactions don't have appropriate documentation, they're not signed, right? So anyone seems to be able to enter into a contract, there are no guidelines. And, and as you enter into a contract and you're, uh, you know, put the company in a position where they're legally obligated to pay. Um, they violate labor laws, and it's based on the president's order, right? The president has a lot of power, and there's no checks and balances. Um, there's no uh, structured accounting and le legal archives, so there's, that means as an auditor, there's a possibility that you won't be able to find documents and records, right? because they don't have a process in place to, to retain those records. And then the important thing is that you have a low average level of employees education, which is how they're able to manipulate these employees, right? Because when you, unfortunately, if you don't have a, uh, if you're not highly educated, that might uh, close you out of certain jobs. So you don't have as much flexibility as, say, someone who is more educated, right? Um, and so as a result of that, the lower level of education, they're highly dependent on their jobs. Um, and so they are, you know, put in a position where they're, you know, uh, badgered or intimidated into following what uh, the president wants for their, their superiors. So some conflicting interests and pressures. Um, it's SMG is one of the largest businesses uh, with a stable and significant demand for services and material. Um, so being a partner with them benefited people, right? Uh, so they wanted to be a part of this company. Uh, they wanted this company's business from a reputation standpoint um, and also be able to make money, right? So they were hopefully they were willing to do whatever it took to continue to be associated with this company, so that's why they did resist the corrupt buying practices. Um, they had weak industry base and infrastructure, right? So uh, that creates problems in terms of logistics and supply chains. Um, because of the type of business, profitability is more unpredictable, right? So it may uh, also measuring um, revenue recognition more difficult. So uh, again, a very complex business. Um, the reputation of the country is relatively small. It was, uh, I'm sorry, population. We have less than 18 million people that live there. Um, and again, we talked about the average level of education and standard of living was really low. There was a lot of nepotism, you know, in the, in the, in the company. Um, and people relied on connections and also with the government, right? So it's not as though the government was um, a, a regulator, right? So they didn't provide any regulations whatsoever. Um, there was a significant network and power in the southern part of the country um, and in the industry. Um, so as a result of that, the company that was looking to purchase them had to deal with the fact that they could suffer significant losses not only in terms of dollar value, right, but also in terms of reputation. So there was a lot of pressure there. And um, some of the factors that uh, that uh, resulted in the corporate corruption and the evolution of the corporate corruption um, was that they had new managers. They were highly organized. Um, they became more focused on the team's interests. Um, as opposed to the corporate interests, right? So they were more, again, what kind of, it's, this is where incentives are important, and we talked about this loosely uh, when we talked about an example with salespeople. Uh, Wells Fargo is another example, right, where um, because of the incentive structure that the company put into place, right, it led people to commit fraudulent acts act, Right, in order to meet the company's incentive structure. Uh, because it wasn't focused on what was best for the company, per se, it was focused on what's best for the team, for my group, for me. Um, the company also had a monopoly on drilling expertise. Um, and 
so as a result of that, their reputations created a high level of trust and power uh, designated, delegated by um, NOS. So because NOS, remember, was buying into a company that they really, uh, or an industry that they didn't have as much expertise in. So they relied on the management um, of the team of the company they acquired. And so as a result of that, they really didn't have a good handle on it. So they gave it too much power. Um, what else? The team. Okay, so you had members of engineers, drillers, economists, accountants, special uh, procurement specialists um, that controlled the majority of the decision making and supervising positions. Uh, the team was responsible for organizing and supervising a large investment program. So essentially, there was just too much power um, delegated into the, that remained with this team. Um, they actively participated in the sem I'm not going to pronounce these names for the seminars and certainly actively participated in anti-corruption work. Um, and thus, as a result of that, they received information um, and they were um, about how their anti-corruption practices were focused, right? So now they have more information. And so it's sort of like if you go in and you're auditing um, and you tell the client exactly what you're going to, every test you're going to perform, exactly what you're looking for, if you're conducting a fraud audit, then you're giving them information, right? So one of the things that we talk about in auditing is you should be able to change up your auditing procedures. You should do the same thing every year, right? You should do the same thing every time because if, if not saying that your client is trying to, to deceive you, but if the client is trying to deceive you, you just give it away. They'll know exactly what you're going to look for, so they know what, where to hide things. Uh, so in terms of internal controls, we hit on the, the, the group that presented hit on some of the internal controls. Um, obviously, you need more experienced people. Uh, they don't have experienced people, and they don't want experienced people, right? So uh, if they had people who were control conscious, then they would those people were trying to implement and help protect the control. Um, and they need to train, implement international financial reporting standards, IFRS, right, because it's an international company, uh, and train and uh, accountants to comply with those practices and those procedures. Um, devise and implement new hiring practice so that you can avoid the conflict of interest that existed between hiring managers. Uh, and keep them from hiring their relatives so to get rid of this idea of nepotism. Uh, I think the team talked about establishing policies on days of supplies and materials to be kept in inventory. So how, how much do you want to remember? So it's not in a company's best interest to have too much inventory on hand. You want to manage your business so that you have inventory to meet your, your customer needs, right? So that uh, you're not, you run the risk that if you have too much inventory on hand, you run the risk of inventory obsolescence, which a company takes a loss. Or it's part of, um, now you, you have to manage and safeguard your assets. So uh, there's a cost to keeping too much inventory on hand. Uh, they should have clear policies for each position, um, like issuing job descriptions, matching them with the actual positions and functions and company goals. Because remember that one of the major issues that the job descriptions that they had and what people were doing didn't match the job descriptions. And uh, uh, it's also important, to, I, as pointed out, for proper segregation of duties, which is an, an important control activity. Um, and they should also require an audit of payroll. And because we, we saw that there were people on the payroll who were cut actually on the payroll, but there was pay, people indicated as being on the payroll and they were not really there, real people require all um, employees to collect their paychecks, right? So if that way you, um, it, it's, if you have that control where the employees actually pick up their paychecks, right, then you uh, reduce the risk that people are on the payroll who should be on the payroll or fictitious or phantom employees on the payroll if people have to pick up their paycheck with proper identification. So those are just, that's just a summary of the key facts. So what you had here, you had incentives and pressures.
because of uh, the significant control at the top, right? Um, by the you know one major shareholder, by management, um, key management personnel. So they they created incentives and pressures for them. Uh, uh, they pushed down to lower employees. The whole attitude of the company, the corporate culture, was one that was corrupt. Just and and the country itself. That's how they did business. And then opportunities because there was a lack of internal control. There was no tone at the top. Right, management, there was no corporate governance, and so that created an environment where this type of fraud was rich, right, um, very uh, easily carried out. And so the company that purchased them uh, knew this, right, because uh, the, their auditors had done some type of a review and said, look, you know, this is not a good deal. But they were willing to take that chance, right, they were willing to buy this company because they wanted to get into that market. So clearly they must have believed that this was a good business decision. And so when you take on that decision, when you take on a company that you know is corrupt, and an environment that you know is corrupt, then there should be, you know, they should have some type of plan to try to, you know, um, improve that company. As said, AJ pointed out, if you're going to bring a company in, uh, maybe just the fact that NOS obviously had better, um, a better type of corporate culture uh, maybe they felt like they could instill that culture, push that culture down to any company that they were. Okay, any questions about the case? Okay, so what I want to do, because I understand by, uh, oh, if you haven't already done so, you should be. You should have been, uh, you should be preparing to uh, cover the negotiation. So, um, have Everyone met or spoken or contacted by their counterpart. Okay, so everyone has their meeting scheduled. Okay, good. All right, so. so I want to go over so I can. I just want to um, kind of give you an introduction to so you know what to expect. How many people have already had a meeting? Oh. <laughs> Gosh, you don't waste any time, did you? Okay, uh, so you cannot. You didn't, didn't waste any time. <laughs> well, you, you had some, you didn't have to you. Uh, Were you ready? We'll find out in the video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, this, uh, as you, I, I, I call it an auditor client interaction case, but really what it, it is an auditor client negotiation case. And so the, the key here is as an auditor, you're going to find, uh, auditors find themselves in situations where they have to, uh, you know, interact with the client to resolve accounting issues because not, and I talk about this all the time, not all accounting issues are black or white. Right, so the two issues that you have to deal with in this case is the inventory obsolescence issue and the allowance without the accounts, right? Um, and so there are very, you know, the client may have to, AJ knows this, right? The client has one position and you have one position. And the objective in doing this is not to try to win, right? It's try to get at the, what you believe the right answer is. What what makes the most sense? What is uh, more representational of the true economic substance of this transaction, right? That's the objective that you want to get at. But you also have to consider what the client's objectives are and arriving and taking those into consideration and arriving at your decision. Um, and so there is no right or wrong answer. What you have to do as the auditor is whatever answer you arrive at, you have to be able to support it and how you got there and why you believe that that answer is representative, is most representative of the substance of the transaction. And so this it's quite possible if, you know, that you guys will come up with different alternatives. But as long as you're able to support your alternatives, uh, and it's reasonable, right, then that's the answer you come up with because, again, remember, for publicly held companies, 
um, the PCOB could come in and look at uh, your audit work papers and how you resolve, and what they're going to focus on are these types of issues, right? These issues that are more uh, subjective, that require judgment, that might be more risky, and how you arrive at, uh, you know, how you arrive at the decision, and what and does it make sense? Right? They might not agree with you, and right? they might not agree with the auditor as to how they got to that answer, but they're going to evaluate whether or not that answer is rational. Like, did you know? Do, are you using facts to support it, right? or are you, you know, they want to see evidence that you did just like, pull a number out of the sky and say, oh, that sounds good. So let's talk a little bit about auditor funding. So um, it is a concern for regulators because um, what they're concerned about is, because first of all, you're not going to negotiate or, uh, or as firms like to say, interact, right? They don't want to say they negotiate with their clients on these types of things. But um, what they're going to say is that, you know, um, you should be able to pick the right answer and come up with it. Right? You should negotiate with them. You should figure out what the right answer is. And so what, uh, what regulators are concerned about is that client auditors are kind of uh, con conceding to clients object. Like they're allowing their own, their own incentives, such as trying to keep the client, uh, to they're allowing their own incentives to dictate how they address these issues or how they resolve these issues. Um, so. It's, uh, you know, it is something that have come, you know, that regulators do look at. And you, and usually, you're, as I said before, you're not going to negotiate a black or white, an objective issue, right? Because you can't negotiate if, if the client, it must say cut off. That's the easiest one. If, did it ship? Yes or no. End of story, right? If it shipped, then I should recognize the revenue. If it didn't ship, that I'm not going to recognize the revenue, assuming it's great on board, right? FOB. Right? So you, if you then, if, if, you're, if you negotiate shipment, did it ship with your client, but it clearly didn't ship, then that's just negligence, right? Because you have no basis to report that revenue if it didn't leave the company's uh, premises, right? So you're not going to negotiate Subject, uh, objective issue, black and white, zero, one. Right? What you end up negotiating or having differences over are these types of, these subjective issues that you see in the case. Right? So just because they're very judgment based. And the client, and AJ probably knows this, the client is going to have some reasonable arguments as to why they think the number should be what they want the number to be. Right? And it's just a matter of whether or not you agree. Or you, and if you've done your planning, then you have some reasonable arguments about what you think that number should be. And as a matter of trying to get to uh, to consider all of the facts that are presented to come to a, 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 a reasonable solution. Okay. So in all cases, again, we're talking about material. Right? These are material. You're not going to negotiate something that's immaterial. It's just not working. It's not going to have a material impact on the financial statement from the negotiated. So it's a means to resolve these disputed financial reporting issues, and trust me, they happen all the time. And when and you know these two that the two that you're looking at in the case are judgment, subjective, but they're not the most complex issues, subjective issues or judgments that auditors have to make. Alright, so what is a negotiation to give and take? You know, it's going to be at least two people involved in it who have different different positions, um, different incentives, uh, different objectives, right? So, uh, you but you want to get to an agreement, right? Because what happens if the auditor and the client cannot reach an agreement? What happens? Sorry. What do you think happens if, if you can't reach an agreement? If an auditor cannot reach an agreement? No negotiation. Well, you negotiate, but you can't reach an agreement. So one thing that the auditors can do is to issue an opinion. Or a qualified opinion, right? So if they can't reach an agreement, what the auditor is basically saying 
is that I think this is a material misstatement. You're not willing to correct it, so therefore, um, I'm going to have to issue a qualified opinion or let's just say in this case a qualified opinion. A client doesn't want that. They don't want to have a qualified opinion. They want a clean audit opinion and a qualified opinion. Right? So the goal is to uh, be able to read some type of an agreement. Right? So um, you'll find that really, so you'll find in this case, and, and this is true of most negotiating, most audits, there are a number of issues that can be before the client and the auditor that they have to resolve. So they could kind of look at this as one issue at a time, or they could look at it at the number of issues on the table and what's the impact of the decision that we have of these issues jointly, right? If I consider both the inventory and the um, accounts receivable issue, what's the impact on that income? What's the impact to uh, the financial state? So when, I, when you um, do this, Right? You want to reach an agreement. So it's very important for you guys. I would like to know that you can reach an agreement. Right? So I don't want you to get in there and say, okay, up, oh, done, not doing it, out. <laughs> right? That's an impasse. I don't want any impasse. Right? This is not like when you go in and negotiate your new car. Right? Okay? Because when you go to negotiate your new car, you can walk away and say, well, because there are like 500 dealers right nearby. And you can go to another dealer and get the same part, right? So, and, and the dealer knows that. The dealer knows that, right? So I don't want you to take that approach. I want you to take the approach of thinking about this. This is going, this has a significant impact on the client's financial statement. And so your objective should be to reach an agreement, not at all costs, but to reach an agreement that you can support, that you believe in that you're not going to have a problem when I look at it and justifying to me and, just, and, and then the uh, other, the Seattle students justifying to their professor how they arrived at this decision. Because you're going to have a sound, rational approach for arriving at that decision. So we don't we want to rule out this idea of beating the opposition. But we do want to reach an agreement um, some people want to compromise. Uh, some people negotiate to settle an argument, and some people to make a point. Your objective is to reach an agreement on the, the, the uh, a reach an agreement on what the number that should be reflected um, in the uh, reach an agreement on the number that should be reflected in the financial statements. So we have two types of negotiation strategies. Um, that you that are normal, and this is not unique to auditors. This is just a general negotiation literature. You have integrative and distributive. So integrate, integrative is the gold standard. Gold standard integrative means that it's uh, uh, you know we both sides win. We have a win-win solution. You're happy, I'm happy. It's rarely achieved. Rarely achieved. And because people don't think in that mindset, people come at negotiations to win. They come at negotiations to make a point. Right? So they don't, they, they don't have that mindset at all. So that ends up in a distributive negotiation where one party wins at the other party's expense. Right? So it's a win-lose. Right? Because we all approach it of trying to get the bigger part of the pie. Think of negotiation. If you think of what you're negotiating, trying to resolve as a pie, we're all trying to get a bigger, bigger slice of the pie. There are two types of uh, uh, types of strategies uh, that fall under distributed, or two types of tactics, I should say, that fall under distributive negotiation strategy. Strategy: contending and concessionary. And contending is where you're not willing to budge whatsoever. You are just not moving from your number. And concessionary is that you make concessions more to, toward your opponent. Right? You give up a lot more. So you want to kind of, what you would like to do is reach this inner win-win. And that means different things to different people. So 
So I'm going to tell you this, if you have information that your opponent, I should say, that your counterpart does not have, and likewise they have information that you don't have, and that's called information asymmetry, right? And that's the real facts of an audit situation, an audit environment. The client knows things, things that you don't. In fact, you, probably, you know, the client knows a lot more. I'm not saying that's the case in this case, but the clients, it's their financial statements. They're the ones who quote the adjustment in the first place. So most clients have already thought about this. They know, right? They've already thought about it. They've already justified why they've come up with this number, and they're ready. And in fact, uh, this is the area that I do. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just have a question. So we said that um, if the client is competitive, if he or she doesn't play, right, that the auditor, the auditor would um, give out like an adverse opinion. So if it's well, um, or qualified opinion. Or, if, 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 or they could withdraw from the engagement. I mean, if they feel okay. like yeah. yeah, so if, what if it was like the opposite way around? What if the, um, if the, I guess if the, the auditor was contending, yeah, if the it could still was, result, right? Then the client, if the auditor is contending, it still results in if either the client is going to concede toward the auditor, and if they don't, they could fire the auditor. So, but they could actually just dismiss the auditor. They could, uh, but not if it's a publicly held company, right? Because so what the in a publicly held company, right? What the the what the auditor has is to be able to go to the audit committee, because only the audit committee can fire or hire the auditor. So the, and in fact, the standards require them to report these types of situations to the audit committee, even if they resolve it. They're supposed to, right? So they do have the ability to go to the audit committee and say, "This is what you know, situation is. This is what we do." Right? So and uh, so, and let me preface this by saying, nobody wants an impasse. The client doesn't want an impasse. The auditor doesn't want an impasse, especially if you're a publicly held client. Think about it. If you're a publicly held client. You have now held up the audit report. If, I mean, being able to release your numbers, your financial statements, to be, to be able to file your 10K because you don't have an audit report. So there is no incentive to reach an impasse. So every, the incentives are greater to try to resolve the issue, to reach agreement, than it is in a publicly held company to not. And you just don't have that luxury. Not that it doesn't happen, but it's not, I, I doubt that that's the, the um, predominant approach. Yes. So does that mean they're, they're more incentive for the client to, to reach a resolution with, 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 with the auditor than the auditor? No, I think the auditor has reputation too. You know, or, or you want, it's a client. You want to retain the client, right? Um, you want to have a good relationship with your client. You, I think everyone's incentives is to reach an agreement, right? To reach the best agreement. Uh, and of course, the auditor want the auditor believes what he or she believes, and that's the number they want. And the client believes what they believe, and that's the number they think. And so, it's how do we get to uh, a number that uh, makes sense to both of us? That both, you know, uh, and it, and there could be some issues in some time. And I would suggest that there are issues where the, the number is the 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 answer that you that the client wants is so far off that it would be uh, professionally irresponsible for the auditor to accept it. And you will know that about your client by like going in. It seems like the, the design is to make make it so that uh, the audit doesn't have to compromise. Yes. Well, that's really interesting. So, uh, it's, and it doesn't work out that way. This is the area that I do research in. Right? So this was, my dissertation was actually on audit and client negotiations. And I uh, had, partners and managers from uh, the big four firms as my participants in, in a study that I designed. And I designed a study uh, where they interacted, and, and this was a situation where they interacted with a hypothetical client, right? It, it's, uh, I, I, I programmed and simulated the client. So um, they, you know, and I had them in different groups and stuff. But basically, um, I would say maybe 20% of my auditors contended where they did not move. Everybody else made concessions. And these were partners and managers. And this was a simulated client, right? Because people are gonna, they, they, 
work the way they normally work. Just the fact, that just because I put them in an experimental environment, didn't change how they approach making judgments and decisions. I gave them a realistic audit case, and and most of them, like I said, most of them made concessions. Some more so than others. Uh, and but and, and I've done this several times, and I've done this with CFOs. Um, and CFOs, we found that the CFOs made concessions, but they were actually more strategic because they read the auditor better. So that's the point of planning. Like auditors are very, at least my research, and I, I've done probably about four or five auditor client negotiation studies. And um, auditors are very um, single-minded. They, this is the, what the number is that they will So usually what auditors do is they have a number that they think is right. That's called a plan, right? So actually, let's go to that slide. So all clients are better at having a backup, right? Their best alternative to no agreement. Clients do that. Right? At least that's what our research suggests, right? That they're more strategic. So because they've already thought through this, what you know, what their backer is, they they start their negotiations very strategically. So uh, one of the studies that I did with the CFOs, they actually started at a number. We, so some of the questions we asked uh, both the auditors and the managers, the CFOs, was, What's your, what do you think the uh, uh, appropriate number should be? Right? Um, and what are you going to start with? Like, so what do you think the appropriate number should be? And what is... Um, you know, your initial starting position. And so for, for CFOs, because they took into account what they believe the auditors thought to be appropriate, because we also asked them that, what do you think the auditors thought? Right, because they took into account what the auditors thought, they're like, hmm, I'm not gonna get to my appropriate number. Because they thought the auditors wanted more, right? Wanted a higher write down. So I'm not gonna get to my appropriate number. So to get as close to my appropriate number as possible, I'm gonna start off making a concession. I'm gonna open up by making a concession. And because they opened up by making a concession, over the course of the negotiation, they made smaller concessions. Like they didn't concede as much because they were more strategic about it, because they incorporate the perspective of their counterpart better than auditors. Whereas auditors, we found, whatever that appropriate number is, is exactly where they started the negotiation. So think about it. If you start the negotiation with what you believe is the appropriate number, you have no room to move. Either you're going to you're not going to get what you want, right? Because if you think the number should be ten thousand, and you start at ten thousand, then either you're going to contend and never move from that number, which then is probably not the best way to like, try to work with somebody. Or you're going to make concessions away from that number right away. Because if you if you do care about your client relationships, right, and the client is saying, well, I'm giving a little bit, why don't you give a little bit? You have no other choice but to move away from that number because you start exactly where you want to be. So that's the challenge, you know, that. So now all you guys who did do that, do I got to do, right? You, you have to think. So you do have to consider, you have to know also What's your best alternative? What's going to cause you not to walk away? Like you and you and it's the, the interesting thing is I think that um, auditors are probably just like all of us when we go to uh, negotiate for a new car. You, you know exactly how much you're going to pay for that car, and you know what is going to make you walk away from that deal and, and go to another deal. You you know what your Batman is, but when they apply that to uh, a, a business setting. Right. I, it, we, we didn't see any evidence that they really consider that. So you want to know um, what's the best course of action to take to be able to get to a yes. Right? That's what you want to do. What, is it, what are we going to have to do to get to a yes? Because you want to reach agreement. Right? So you also want to think about what your, what your counterpart wants. So you have in your case 
some enough information to be able to at least uh, consider how your client's incentives and what they want, and then how you would respond to that. Because that's going to also help you to give, you know, if they come at you with something, that you're, you're, you're able to respond to it, right? You're able to say, well, here's why that's not a good argument, or here's why I have a concern with that. inventory issue and an accounts receivable valuation issue. Both very subjective, right? Um, so again, I, the objective of this case is so you can kind of really think through uh, what the interactions are like between auditors and clients. Like the, probably in your first few years, you will never ever be involved in an auditor-client negotiation, right? But it happens. Um, and usually it's partners and managers who are involved at this level. And also, I want you to think about things that we talked about, judgment biases, being skeptical. Uh, someone spoke to me about the case and they raised some things that said to me that they were thinking very skeptically. Right? So consider the management incentives um, and you know what does that mean? How might those incentives impact uh, what amount the manager is trying to record? Or wants to report. Um, you know, you want to think about how do you reach an agreement, obviously, that doesn't violate GAAP. So you have to consider that these are all these issues. All of these issues are material to the financial statement. Yes. Um, so we're discussing with uh, students in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Should we, um, if we're trying to prepare our home to compromise, should we actually like kind of uh, use? Auditing terms like independence, or do you think that would just like? Oh yes, no. You that was like auditing terms. They'd be able to like. Uh, yeah. You see, they might work. They don't comprehend. Like, you know, no, they are. These are accounting students. They're accounting. They're accounting majors, okay. but they haven't taken auditing. Right now, they're yeah. in a um, uh, controllership class. I think that's oh, so I don't, that's something. Oh, they're in. A, they told you that it's a negotiation class. Last time, that right, last year when I did this, the students were in a controllership. But the difference is, they don't know what you know. Right? They don't know auditing like you. They don't know the standards that you know. Right? You have, if you're at a point in your, your studies where you have a better grasp on accounting. It's financial accounting standards. <coughs> what is the only thing? My guy was an auditor. <laughs> really? <laughs> what? Well, an intern. Oh, he's a, I think he's an MBA student. He's already got a CPA and a CFA. Wow. <laughs> That's unusual. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, but all MBA students are not accountants. All MBA students don't have a degree in accounting. So, mm -hmm. so they can't do all of that. They might have been trying to intimidate you. How do you know? Okay, my guys are booked. Oh, you went on like that. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so, let me talk, so let's, let's deal with that. So do you think they're smarter than you because they're MBA? That was the problem. What's the problem? What's the problem? <laughs> Those are two the no, so, no, I'm not, no, I'm not trying to diminish what you're thinking. I just don't want you walking into that association and thinking that, like, oh, they're MBAs. They have no more or no less. You, they, the common information everyone has, the client information that they have is just to help set them up in terms of how they want to approach the issue. So it's telling them to think, these are the things that are important to you as a client. The auditor information that you have is telling you totally the same thing, right? And so um, you, because remember, and here's the deal, think about it. You can, if you are, let's say you are a manager in an audit firm, and you have to negotiate with the chief financial officer who has, you know, tremendous amount of experience. It's their, you know, their, their net client management, they know the financial statements, um, you know, because it's their financial statements. You don't want to allow 
But you can find yourself in that situation with somebody who has more experience than you and, and might be more knowledgeable about the company than you, uh, that you could be interacting with. But that, you know, so let's think, then you, you're not going to document in your work paper as well. I thought the answer should be 10 million, but then the controller, who is the CFO, who has more experience than I have, they are, you know, uh, this is their bit of paper together the financials. Um, they convinced me it should be five million. And if they know more than I do, you're never going to document that. You're, of course, you're not going to document that, right? You're going, so that's the importance of the pre plan right? So in any case, and I didn't remember saying, so before you actually go in and start to interact with them and negotiate with them, that you've identified what the alternatives are. And you've identified what you're, what you find is an acceptable answer. You might have a range of acceptable answers, and you have to identify. I am, I'm not going to uh, allow an answer lower than this number. Right? This is as, this is as low as I'm going to go in terms of right, the write-off. What if they provide like documentation that says that that number is good? Can you say that uh, it's a good number to go? Uh, and not if only the documentation is convincing to you, if you can explain why you think that documentation is convincing. Because how do you know they didn't just make up something? Right? That's what you don't know that, right? So you have to, to uh, because they have, the, you have case facts, they have case facts. And I can tell you that they have no, the case facts that they have is no greater than the case facts. Parts of being able to evaluate the So I don't care if they're MBA students. I can't believe you guys went on LinkedIn. And <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think well, see what happens, right? But okay, so when you did that, now you kind of set your you set up a mindset, right? And think about if you didn't do that, would you have the same mindset? No, because they would just be students to you, right? That's it, they're students. They have to get a grade just like you have to get a grade. And just think about it this way. You can't be fired. Right? That would be the auditor's biggest old the client could fire me. You can't be fired. I'm curious to know. Like, see, you can't let that stuff get you. Right? All right, so let's just... Uh, Okay, so the, the and, and um, AJ pointed this out. He said they did, you know, produce some kind of evidence. And I, I'd like to know what that evidence is. But they produce some kind of well, management tends that. But you know what, AJ, that's a good point, right? Because that's what management management is in management's first move in in in, uh, in you know in a real environment, right? Real audit environment. Because they prepare the financial statements. They know exactly what's in the financial statements. And so they're prepared, they know that an auditor is coming, right? They know that they are going to, uh, uh, they're going to be audited. So they're prepared to defend their position. Right? You come in as auditors and you're reviewing the financial statements, so now you're getting information. So you're like, oh, wait a minute, what's this about? They're already prepared. Like, my best friend is a senior vice president um, for this bank. And a part of her responsibilities is interacting with the auditors. So she's interacting with the managers and the partners. So, you know, um, and uh, she said, it helps that she's a CPA and a former auditor herself. She says, I know exactly what they're gonna ask me. I know it. She says, so by the time they come, she says, I know exactly what accounts they're gonna challenge me on. I know exactly what their arguments are going to be. She said, because I've already thought it through. She says, so by the time that they, I, she says, when I'm trying, when I'm putting together documentation for them, she says, I've thought about their arguments. And so when they come to me with their arguments, I'm prepared for their arguments. That's that. So she is more strategic in negotiation, right? Because she's more prepared than the auditors are. And as a result of that, you know, and she's dealing with partners who have twice as much experience as she has, right? But she has thought about, she's thought about this issue from the perspective of the auditors. 
and the auditors, as auditors, you have to think about issues from the perspective of the client. What is it that, what are their incentives? Right? And remember, this is information that you're gonna get while you are going through this whole process of understanding the client's business, knowing what the tone at the top is, how much, man, you know, whether management has incentives or pressures to, to you know, meet analyst forecasts or things like that. You have, you have more information than you think you have as an auditor, right, to, to, get, to gather insight about the client. So in this case, you know, there's, you know, you, it's managerial, they know more information than you know sometimes, but in this case, I'm telling you not, they just have different information. Um, and you have information that they don't have. Um, if management has incentives, right, then when you have these types of issues, it offers them greater opportunities to act on that incentive. So you have to think about, well, what's management's incentives um, for opportunism, right, to report opportunistically versus their incentives that they want to have a good reputation, reporting reputation, that it matters to them what uh, what kind of information they put out there in the capital market, right? Um, so you want to think about, uh, you know, audit committees, because the other, so in this way, the, both the, myself and the other professor in Seattle, you know, we, his students, he's, he's serving as an audit committee member and I'm serving as an audit committee member. So he's gonna challenge his students as to, you know, why'd you come up with that answer? Like he's not just going to accept it if they come up with some wild answer that clearly violates GAP. That's not acceptable. So that, that's a mandate for them just as, you know, I'm gonna hold you accountable for the answers that you come up with, right? So there's that monitor, we, we, we instill some monitor mechanisms, right? Because he, his students can't come back to him and say, oh, I came up, I got this just because I, I was, you know, uh, not because there's any economic rationale for this number, but just because I was trying to win, they can't say that to me. So, and I'm telling you this, is that's what we're talking about, right? So we, we're kind of uh, simulating the audit committees in this environment. So as you know, if you haven't already done so, make sure that you prepare for the, the uh, think about what your alternatives are, what you think is acceptable, make sure you think about it from their perspective. Why would management want to, do they want to uh, report opportunistically, or do you think that they're the type of people, you know, given the case that they have to follow the rules in the case, right, um, that wants to try to reach a resolution. Can you, the, you know, can you, are they reasonable? Do you think they'll be reasonable? And, and consider that they might not be. And how would you respond to that if they're not? And then, so in the case, it gives you the information about uh, the reporting, um, how that you should report it, upload it. Um, and also, so what you're going to turn in is not only you're going to turn in the recordings, turn in the Excel spreadsheet with your alternatives, but there are also questions that are asked, the, the questions about your, your approach going in, um, your rationale. Uh, for the, uh, the alternatives that you selected and the one that you finally ended up resolving, how your perspective of your counterpart and, and their perspectives, so you can uh, submit that through an Excel document. I'm sorry, through a, a Word document. So any questions before, and I'm available. Shoot me an email if you you know if you have any questions that you're preparing to interact with the, you know, arrange for your meeting, just shoot me an email and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. So for the questions that you said you can do in the Word document, is it okay if we just do it in Excel and like add columns to it? Because I think because there are like different types of columns that you can add to it. Yeah, so you can add like the columns that you want to add to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.